Well, let's look at the Bible, the Bible as our supreme authority. We were talking about God as our supreme authority, and this is in the realm of life. He's bringing into our life things that he chooses. Uh, James 1 tells us that the trials and problems that we face are, um, has a purpose, and that purpose is to uh, uh, help us to grow because it's as we, as we learn endurance in these things, we begin to see that um, God uh, has planned it. We uh, are learning things in a difficult way because we uh, perhaps were not ready to learn them in the gentle way of just obedience to the scripture. So the Bible as our supreme authority is a natural uh, corollary and a natural uh, deduction from the first one that God is our supreme authority. So let's look at two things concerning the Bible. One is revelation and the other is inspiration. So first of all, let's look at the concept of revelation. And maybe that uh, these terms are, are new or perhaps uh, unfamiliar to you. And we want to make sure that you have a clear understanding of this. So Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. You see the capital O-R-D, Jehovah our God. But those things which are revealed, excuse me, revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Um, the word revealed is the, is the key here. Uh, God knows everything, and what he doesn't tell us are basically the secret things. They belong to him. Leave it alone. <laughs> um, if it were important for us, he would have told us. But um, as it is, he has given us all the important stuff, and he's revealed to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. If you back up just a moment to think why he gave us the law. We have the preachers who are saying that he put this as a test before us to see if we could master this law and so on. Really what it is, is as any parent tells the children not to do the things that are dangerous, not to do the things that would be bad for them. Uh, don't drink and smoke and chew and, and uh, uh, roller skate in the street and whatever else, you know, anything that, that uh, is bad for them. Um, they say, don't do that. Now, it is the command of the parents, and it is an offense to the parents if the child says, I don't care what you say, and I'll do it anyway. But the loser in this is the child who disobeys. Uh, God told us not to do these things because they're bad for us. You go through the law, the words of the law, and you find out, Christ told us that the words of the law tell us how to love God and how to love our fellow man. It doesn't mean we just all oh, have a pleasant attitude toward them. It means obey the law and you're doing this work of love. So um, the law here not including the sacrifices and, and the uh, civil law of, of Israel. Uh, the uh, Bible haters always love to mock the idea that, that God actually told them how to uh, how to live out in the wilderness and to dig a hole for uh, when they have to go to the bathroom and fill it in later. And so if you believe the Bible, that's what you're going to have to do. And well, that was, that was for them then. You see. He doesn't, uh, everything in the Bible, he hasn't written to us, uh, but he has written it for our uh, uh, development, our understanding, our, our growth. So the point of that is that it's a good advice if you're out in the wilderness. Um, you can uh, uh, learn these things if you don't have a, a bathroom to go to. All of that to say, uh, uh, he is keeping us safe. This is why there's this blessing that's attended to people who are obedient. The blessing is that our life is better. Our life is less problematic. Now, we'll have the ups and downs on that high road, on his road, but we're not going to suffer what, what the unbeliever suffers. We're not going to suffer that shame of sin, that breakdown because 
we've we've tortured our body with uh, drugs and alcohol or whatever you know we just won't have that kind of problem so um, uh, this is the idea that the the benefit that God revealed these things to us that we may do them uh, we will have you know that I remember reading in some or maybe it was TV show some but the person was crying out why why does God hurt us when he puts us into life and doesn't tell us what the rules are. I went, excuse me, he told us the rules. <laughs> he told you what's good and what's bad. Uh, you weren't paying attention. You, see. you flunked the test. So uh, didn't do your homework. So this is revelation. Revelation happens when God reveals to man what man does not know and cannot know by himself. The Bible is the most complete avenue of revelation. There are uh, avenues, you know, the, the nature that he created speaks of God. It sings forth his praise. And so if you're paying attention with an open godly mind, God is speaking to you of himself. Christ himself said, the love of God is shown by that he sends his uh, rain and sunshine even on the ungodly. He's quite capable of turning the lights off as he did in Egypt and will do later in uh, the realm of uh, Antichrist. Uh, thick darkness, thick darkness where you can shine a light but it's not going to go very far. Uh, but he doesn't do that generally. And uh, uh, so he shows his love by the things that he's done. He shows, uh, he, he goes back to uh, the sun and the moon and the uh, seasons and so on. He says, if I fail to uh, raise the sun one morning, then you can begin to doubt my covenants. You see, when I make a promise, I, I do it for good. Paul spoke of God's scripture before it was completed, and I've emphasized God's scripture because I guarantee you, I don't know what I'm guaranteeing, but uh, I guarantee you that most of the time you hear these verses quoted, they'll be telling you that it's about heaven, things that we, we can't even imagine how wonderful heaven is going to be. I'm sorry, it's not about heaven. It's a nice verse if you wanted to think about it for heaven, but he's not talking about heaven. Notice if you add... Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, he says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And this is what they, they stop right there because that sounds like heaven. See? But he goes on and he says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. That's the inspiration of the Scripture. The Holy Spirit inspired it. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit is God, and he searches the deep things and has revealed them to us in the scriptures. So, um, uh, as, as, as true as it is of you know, not knowing the future, yet the emphasis here is that your eye has not seen what God would reveal, and your ear hasn't heard it. You can't get this by your senses, and it hasn't entered into the heart of man. That's imagination, see. Uh, what God reveals to us uh, is beyond man's imagination. We see that today. I mean, the whole theory of evolution is the imagination of man, and the reality is creation, which is a far greater uh, wonderful thing. Charles Hodge, great old theologian, said, What was undiscoverable by human reason, God hath revealed by his Spirit. So we recognize that God knows literally everything. Whatever has been, whatever will be, and all that might have been. <laughs> Remember that he said to the uh, rebellious cities, uh, Capernaum, uh, Bethsaida, Chorazin, uh, Capernaum, yeah, Capernaum, yeah, all through those three, he says that um, if Sodom and Gomorrah had the miracles that I've done in you, they would have repented. So that's a might have been thing. 
And uh, he, he knows all of this. Uh, God worked it all together like this enormous chess master looking ahead at all the things. If he does this, I would do this. If this happens, if... and he has it all planned out. And he did that in that moment of creating, of uh, planning it all out. So uh, he knows what all is even possible. But he has revealed to us only what we must know and understand to accomplish his will. Now, if you think about that, what we must know, he hasn't thrown in a bunch of stuff that's unimportant. This is why it's important to study the Bible. I remember reading through the Old Testament as I was growing up and saying, man, I spent a lot of time about these people getting old and dying. And, uh, you know, it doesn't bless my day at all, you know. You get, you get to feel sorry for Andy. You know, he lived so many years, Andy died, Andy died, Andy died, Andy died. So the point is that uh, I didn't realize that, and then I went back and I was trying to, to see how old people were and how, how, how much time had passed and all that, and then I went back to those very things, and I'm adding all up all those years and everything, and, and then after he had a son, he lived so many years, and so on, putting it all together, and without those, I wouldn't have been able to figure out um, you know, surprising things, like, like Jacob and Esau, uh, when they were deceiving, when Jacob was deceiving his father, it was in his 70s. <laughs> what? Goofy young kids, you know? <laughs> and, uh, um, but, uh, you know, they lived at such an age that uh, that was early in life. All right. Authority comes from the general concept, from the concept of revelation, because Almighty God, the supreme authority, reveals to us what he considers essential for us to know. So give some weight to everything you read in the Bible. Let it weigh upon you as essential, as something you must know. Meditate on it. Let it sink in. So that's looking at the concept of revelation and God doing the revealing, then we bow to what he has revealed. Then uh, with what he's given us, what he's revealed us is in the Bible, let's look at the concept of inspiration. I'll divide this into two parts. The first is the product of inspiration and then we'll look at the process. But the product 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and if you haven't memorized this, this would be a great memory verse. Verses. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, because this is at the heart. Uh, the Apostle Paul is in prison and he's going to die in prison as he writes 2 Timothy. And uh, uh, the last, last book he wrote was 2 Timothy. And he turns young Timothy's mind to the scriptures. And we have here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, those four things, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Uh, why did he inspire this? That you might grow and mature and be then capable of doing good things. It's not what you think is good, what you hope is good. It's what you know is good because God has explained it to you, giving you the very words that he needed. Now, all of these words mean things. Let's look at this. Scripture is literally that which is, was written. I've mentioned before that God uses several words for the word word. <laughs> There's a chrema which means the spoken word. That's used in uh, Romans 10 where it says um, that uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Actually, it's chrema, uh, comes by the spoken word. Your faith comes when the word of God is spoken to you uh, uh, by preaching or by just hearing the word of God. So uh, there's chrema. Then there is grama, this one, which means the written word, and then there's logos, which is the word in concept. 
the concept, the, the word in your mind, the word spoken, the word heard, the word written, all of that is, is word. Even the, uh, the concept of a word as something that explains what I'm thinking about. I choose a word to explain what I'm thinking. You're reading my mind as you listen to my words. And um, if my words are careful, then you're reading my mind accurately. I'm, I'm giving you my mind accurately. But this is the word, the written word of God. So this is the verse, verse 16, that talks about inspiration. If we're going to understand inspiration, you have to take it from this verse. And it says here that what was inspired were the written words of God. And I emphasize this because the theologians writing about this, they say this, but they don't pay attention to it. And then they're asking questions. They keep talking about the inspired writers. The writers weren't inspired. What they wrote was inspired. You see the difference. Uh, this wasn't a work on a person. It was the work on what was written. Uh, we saw in the epistles to the Thessalonians that Paul says, now I write this end in my own hand. So uh, he didn't actually write he didn't put on the uh, whatever it was papyrus um, what he was uh, what he was saying. He was dictating it and only wrote on the end. So you have a an inspired writer. Then what about the guy who is do, doing the secretary? What if he misheard, like Jerry was saying? You know, um, if he if he didn't quite understand it. See, um, Jerry might hear something. I might hear something at Wednesday night. And write down something that's entirely different. Uh, uh, people say, well, you had it this way, but it actually spelled like this. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the thing is, the, the, the person who is actually writing it might have misunderstood what was being said. So you have all kinds of errors creeping into the Bible in this way. That's not what he says. It is inspired words. This is the product. Inspiration guaranteed a product and that was the written word. However it came by, you know, Luke talks about how he, he had, a, he, uh, what do you call it, uh, had, a, had a dialogue with uh, eyewitnesses. He um, uh, in, interviewed, he interviewed the eyewitnesses. A lot of what he says is uh, about the birth of Christ is um, from uh, uh, Mary's words, evidently, because you see Mary's side of things. Uh, after he did this investigation. So, all of that to say, it's the product, and that's the written word. This is why going back to the original, that I often do to you, to say now the word, like I'm doing here with the word scripture, this is important because it wasn't just a general word. God inspired this. Now, the word inspired means God breathed. Theopneustia or God-spirited even. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, it, my spoken word comes by my breath. This is pastor-breathed words. And um, so this is what he's saying, that as if, I, I want you to grasp this image. You sit down and open the Bible and you start reading, you are hearing what would you would hear if God sat down beside you and was talking to you. He is saying to you through the word what he spoke. And, um, you know, he gave you everything that he wanted when he completed the Bible. And so he wouldn't say anything new. He might say, hey, how are you doing? I don't know, but he would know that because we probably wouldn't ask. But anyway, the point is that he wouldn't be adding anything to the word of God because he already gave that to us. He considered that, see. He understands what you'll need from your Bible reading next Thursday. And he put that in the Bible. <laughs> if that was the only reason, that's why he put it in the Bible. But then some guy in 1800s, he needed that on another Thursday. So, you know, he puts it all together. He, he worked that all out. So the words were God-breathed and profitable. These are the two things. So uh, it isn't just that. God breathed it. Everything there is profitable. This is why 
uh, you know, God didn't uh, inspire everything. In the New Testament time, before the Bible was completed, God had given the gift of prophecy. And under that gift, then Jenny might, uh, if we were back in those times, Jenny would say, I have a message from God. Yes, please, stand and tell us. So she would, she would speak then a phrase, and it might be, um, uh, Donna Likens needs to stop smacking her uh, grandson around. <laughs> well, that wasn't inspired. It didn't come in the Bible because it was not profitable for the rest of us. Profitable for her grandson, but not for, for the rest of us. See. All of that to say, and of course I'm making that up, but uh, the, the thing is that this is uh, the difference. What was inspired is also profitable, as I found out by checking all those uh, years and dates of the people. Uh, it was important that God had put that down. Now, since the goal of the believer's life is to become Christ-like, be conformed to the image of Christ, we must go to the scriptures. And we do that for those four things that I mentioned. Teaching, this means the information about the way things really are. He is giving us truth. The truth as God knows it. And he knows everything. So it's not like, I think it's this, you know, like my answers in geometry class. This is God's truth, which is absolute truth. For instance, Proverbs 6, 23a, for the commandment is a lamp or a candle producing light, and the law is light. We are in darkness of ignorance. You know, try to find your way out of a place when all the lights go off. But if you have a light, turn on your phone light or your um, cherry cigarette lighter for uh, Pipe lighter? No. <laughs> anyway, uh, making that up. Um, you, you have light and you can see. You can begin to see the way things really are. You're not running into it. There you go. There you go. Flashlight. Okay. Man prepared. He used to be a Boy Scout, didn't he? No? Huh? Girl Scout? All right. Um, teaching. Then reproof. This is the pointing out of our sinful attitudes, our sinful words, and our sinful deeds. He points that out. Proverbs 6.23b, the second part of the one we were just looking at. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. There's little, little corrections, you see. Oh, wrong, wrong step. Psalm 119, 9 and 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How am I supposed to know how to do it? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Oh, I see. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Hide it in your heart, and you don't have to read it to find out how to do it. You've already read it. You've already hidden it in there. Now it's part of you, part of the way you think. Then there's correction. This is the reorientation, the correcting of your map, the ideas, the maps of action, the actions of your life. I, I went the wrong way, and he says, you should have done this. This is where you went off the path. That's why you're in the brambles, you're in the snares. All right, get back on the path, that's correction. Proverbs 15, 10, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, the proper highway of God. And he that hateth reproof shall die. Because he told you, these are the things that are gonna promote your life rather than limit your life. And then instruction. And this is that broad thing, the ongoing lessons of life lived correctly and profitably. Um, how important was this? Acts 15, 35, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch doing what? Teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Part of that original church work was the teaching of the word of God. Acts 18, 11, and he continued there, the Greek is he sat there, he sat there as a teacher, a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, talking about God's gifts to the church, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some, and this is definite article with uh, 
uh, and, and it means pastor, teacher is a, a two, two definitions, two words meaning the same thing. So the pastor slash teacher. And why did he give that? For the perfecting, the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So with this we understand then that proper use of the scripture allows the child of God, man or woman, to become mature and profitable to God and others. Authority, in this sense, comes from the concept of inspiration. We said it came from the concept of revelation. It comes from the concept of inspiration because the words of the Bible are the very worlds, words, no, take out that L, uh, very words of God. There are worlds of God, but this is not that. All right. The concept then are this, that um, God is our supreme authority. His word given for us, for our needs, then carry that authority. All right. Now let's look at the process, <coughs> excuse me, the process of inspiration. <coughs> and this has been confused with the product that we were looking at earlier. But uh, 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, I said that it was in 2 Timothy. Paul wanted to get Timothy grounded on the scripture. And uh, the last letter that P Peter wrote also goes back to the scripture. And he says this, knowing this first, this means of first importance, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, don't limit the word prophecy to mean foretelling the future. The word prophecy in both verses refers to everything that God reveals to man, not merely the future. By prophecy... God spoke to Moses to write Genesis about the creation of the world. Things past, not future, you see. In our uh, series in the uh, morning and evening services, we're dealing about th things that God has revealed about the future. But um, uh, prophecy is forthtelling the things of God, not just foretelling. All right, the word interpretation um, no private interpretation. I kept Second Peter up there so you can see where it's used. Not of any private interpretation <coughs> is Strong's 1955 epe lusis. Epe is a pawn. It comes from the verb epeluo. If you're studying Greek, you, you learn the verb luo, and that's how you learn the conjugation of the verb, luo, luois, lue, and so on to loose. It means to unloose or untie. Unloose is an odd word to me. Uh, if you loose something, you, you're you untying it. If you unloose it, wouldn't that be making it not so loose? Uh, anyway, unloose. Unloose or untie. I didn't do that. Strong's concordance did that. Unloose or untie. So, the scriptures does not come from... I think about weird things, don't I? The word... Dealing with the scripture means that the revelation from God did not come from any human's personal releasing. It was not released out of his heart. It wasn't released out of his mind, private, personally. Now, the word came, it came not in old times, uh, and then also the word moved, but uh, both of them are uh, strong, 5342, pharaoh, pharaoh. It means was carried. So this is a strong idea. There's, there's the idea of movement, of uh, pushing. This is pick it up and carry it. This is, you know, you're moving something the most absolutely uh, clear way. You're, it's, it's going where you're taking it, the idea of carried. And then the word will, uh, there's a word that refers to determining it to be done, but this is the word that means wishing. So it says that it did not come by the wishfulness, even the, the, uh, even the uh, 
uh, hope of man. He says, huh? Seems like a good day to write scripture. And that didn't happen like that. All right? Then, again, the word moved is the word pharaoh, carried. It's in the present passive, was being carried. And uh, so you see, they were being carried. The, the men of God, were be, the writers, were being carried by the Holy Spirit. You sense how strong that is? They weren't going where they wanted in the writing. Um, I, there's a, a, a thing that you'll find in the theology books where it says, we do not believe in uh, the dictation theory of inspiration. Well, yeah, I think we do. And I've finally uh, traced this back. Um, Augustus Strong, in his theology book, says that. But he doesn't say that it's a quote. Well, it ends up that um, Westcott, of the Westcott and Hort thing, who didn't believe in inspiration, said that. Of course we don't believe in you know, dictation theory, that God dictated it. Well, the psalmist says, I'm a ready pen, a ready writer. You know, I'm the pen of the guy actually writing. And uh, that's, that's dictation. God was dictating this. So um, we find that he, you, know, you might use a different color pen for writing something. Or you might use a typewriter. I don't know anybody uses a typewriter. But you may use a printer might send an email, thank you note, or whatever. And the way you wrote it is also part of the communication. So who he chose is part of it as well because he was using the, the education, he was using the vocabulary of the people that he had. Yes? God used uh, the image of fingers writing words on yeah. the phallus wall. Yes, yeah, right, yeah. So it must have been more than an image because it was actually scratching stuff into the wall, right? <clears throat> so he made part of a man's hand and uh, scratch it in. So, yeah, this is, this is the way he did it with men. He picked them up and moved them. So let's look at this word for a moment. <clears throat> in Acts 27, 15, and 17, we're talking about the, the storm that shipwrecked the, um, the, the ship that Paul was being carried as a prisoner to Rome. And the King James translated it there, let her drive and were driven. They said, let the wind take us wherever it wants. We're not going to try to struggle with it anymore. So a strong wind drove the ship, pushing it before him. You take this concept back, and these men who said, Paul said, it's time to write the Thessalonians again. And God says, all right, Holy Spirit, carry him. Drive before him. And so he was taken where... Uh, he didn't necessarily know where he was going. We see the Spirit drove the writers to write inspired words, the very words of God. He drove them far beyond their own control. This is why the Scripture tells us that the prophets of old, prophesying the coming Messiah, <laughs> they went back and read their own words saying, boy, this is deep, I wonder what it means. You know, They were, they were writing things that were beyond their immediate understanding. All right, let's close then with the question of authority because the, the, what we're dealing with here is what the world thinks about this contrasted to what the Christian does. So let's look at unbelieving philosophies. One is, we don't need the scripture, we have reason. We have reason. The arrogance of this concept is that if it doesn't make sense to me, it cannot be true. Well, what? Do you know everything? Do you know all possibilities? Do you, are you like God? Um, you know, if you've ever been, uh, had a mathematics test and you didn't understand how to do it, um, in this reasoning, you would say, well, it does not reasonable to me, so it must be wrong. Well, how much of the Bible is un, unknown to the unsaved person? It wasn't even written to them, see? Uh, he is, he, his spirit is not yet alive, and it's uh, only spiritually discerned. 
So reason is not a good idea. John Gill said, there are some things in the scripture which, though not contrary to reason, yet are above the capacity of men ever to have made a discovery of as the trinity of persons in the Godhead. You can't, by reason, by analyzing your senses, you're not going to figure out that God is a triune being. We would never come up with that. Then other feelings. Well, I just don't feel that that's the way it is. By removing the Bible as an objective truth, the unbeliever allows himself to take his authority from how he feels about a subject. I was talking to a man, a professing Christian, he said, well, I, uh, I actually study all of the different religions. I've told you this before. And I, I take what's the best out of them all. And I said, really? I said, what makes you think that you have any capacity to understand what's good or bad in the religions? Isn't it more likely that you're taking the things that you just like out of it? You're, you're disposing, perhaps, of the things that would make you better. And you're keeping all the things that are just going to keep you the way you are. I said, I, I wouldn't trust a religion like that. It gives you no ability to to better yourself because you're only taking what you like out of it. Feelings. So how do I feel about it? Who cares? I was at a Bible study where they said, well, I think maybe what we ought to do is that we'll uh, read a passage and then we'll go around and, and everybody say how you feel about it. I said, well, that would be a waste of time for me. <laughs> because as important as your feelings are to you, they're not that important to me. Um, you know, how do you feel about murdering babies? You know, uh, I, I don't care. God says it's wrong. So that's what I want to know, what God says. All right, the third one is conscience. The unbeliever may think that conscience should be the true basis of authority. Well, the problem with this view is that man's conscience is only as good as his training and experience. A missionary came to a, a tribe in uh, lower Africa where uh, they had a moral code that the top of you had to be covered up. And so you had people from the belly button on down were naked, you know, and this was embarrassing to the missionaries, and they tried to explain to them that this isn't, uh, the, 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 that, that form of nudity was not something that a good Christian would be appreciative of. But uh, their conscience was uh, assuaged by, you know, wearing a T-shirt uh, or whatever, and... Uh, uh, conscience is just what it's made of. See? So if you had a background where, you know, punching people was the normal way of handling an argument, uh, your conscience would, would be okay with that. Um, then a fourth one is the neo-Orthodox view, and this is just a slightly different part of unbelieving. Karl Barth came up with this. Uh, briefly, the... Uh, Neo-Orthodoxy, the Orthodox view is um, standard Christianity, the right doctrines. Neo-Orthodoxy said, you know, none of our preaching seems to be reaching people like, for instance, Spurgeon. So they went back and they just took Spurgeon's sermons and redefined everything. So they say, now we believe in the inspiration of Scripture, but it meant something else entirely. For instance, he said, authority, Karl Barth said, Bart, German, uh, defined authority as coming from the Word. But by the Word he meant Christ, not the Scripture. What does that mean? Well, I, I don't think Christ would say that. It, the Word is witnessing to what I think Christ would say. Christ's not there talking to you, so this is now your imagination. It's either your reason, your feelings, your conscience. It's something like that. But it's not objective. It's just how you think it might feel, see so it's, it's all up to you now to decide what's right and wrong. So uh, he taught that the Bible witnesses to the word, but it does so with errors and mythology. It's a good story like Pandora and the, and the box uh, that uh, is instructive, but uh, certainly not true. That's, Don, that's what they said about your book of Esther, right? Uh, no, not true, just mythology, but, but good story and helpful to men. Nah, <laughs> that's goofy. All right, now the believer's view, not views, but the believer's view. The basis of authority is external to man, 
I don't have the right to tell you what is authoritative if I can't establish it from something that's external to me and is objective, not subjective about how you feel. Uh, I am not under the authority of a man concerning the things of God, the things of, of Christ. My Christian rules come from the Word of God, not from the traditions of men. Now, Roman Catholicism, across the street, holds to a conservative view of authority. It's external and it is uh, objective, but it claims that authority rests on the rule of the church. You see? John Calvin, who dealt with this a lot, said, Hence the scriptures obtain full authority among believers only when men regard them as having sprung from heaven. If, if the scriptures doesn't come from God, then it's not authority. As if the living words of God were heard. But a most pernicious error widely prevails, in his time of course, that scripture has only so much weight as is conceded to it by the consent of the church. And then he says, as if the eternal and inviolable, that you cannot violate the truth of God, depended upon the decision of men. God is above men. Baptists limit the basis of religious authority to the Bible alone. The Bible's revelation will demand the believer's reason and feeling to understand the Bible. You have to engage your entire person, logic, feelings, everything in the Bible, and then you'll gain a true understanding. T. Reese in the standard, uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, Men need to know what is true, that they may do that which is right. They need some test or standard or court of appeal which distinguishes and enforces the truth, forbids the wrong, and commands the right. This is why I try to be careful <coughs> to tell you this is what's right. And here's the proof. Here's the Bible. See? I try to document what I'm telling you because it's not good enough for the pastor just to say it. You need to know why I'm saying it. See? Not because I was raised that way. Not because I particularly like it because it suits my conscience. Uh, it's what the Bible says. And I hope that trains you to actually ask that question when the person preaches it. You say, and where do you find that? We had a guy that always, he was an upperclassman, I was a freshman talking about this, and well, I think this thing means, and he'd say, what's your scripture? Man ruined our conversations. We, we had no scripture. We, we were just, you know, thinking about it. John Calvin continues his quote, but such wranglers, people who are resting the scripture about uh, uh, the church teaching the only truth, are neatly refuted by just one word of the apostle. He testifies that the church is built upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles. That verse is uh, Ephesians 2.20, and the churches are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So you, you catch the logic of what he's saying. The church doesn't establish the scripture. The scripture establishes the church. So if and he concludes, if the teaching of the prophets and apostles is the foundation, this must have had authority before the church began to exist. And indeed, God founded the church on the Old Testament prophecies of the New Covenant and on the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we, therefore, rejoice to know what our supreme authority, God, desires of us on a day-by-day -day basis. Jesus summarized all the law and the prophets, teaching as love God and love your fellow man. So the law and the prophets, therefore, detail how we are to show God's desired love. We obey out of our love response to him. We're not trying to get saved. We're not trying to earn a gold star from, he from heaven by obeying, you see. We're saying, thank you for taking me out of the muddy pit of my ignorance, my evil, and saving me, showing me the light of truth. Thank you for that. And so we obey out of love. Jesus told us 
John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, that's our motive. And then John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You abide in my love, I abide in his love, because we are obedient people. All right. Thank you for your kind attention. Bring up comments or questions. All right. Well, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed with prayer. Father, you've given us an opportunity to examine the authority that you have and that you have communicated to us by the word of God. We thank you that you have revealed to us things we didn't know, couldn't know, and you have established that revelation word for word in the Bible. We ask that you might guide and direct us then in the study of the word of God because you have only given us what we need to know, what we must know to live aright. So we must hide this word in our heart that we might not sin against thee. So guide and direct us, put us on that safe path. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.